Primary of Jared Orchen, and today we're going to learn about the inauguration of the yeshiva in Yavne. After the Jewish people, after the destruction of the Second Temple, I would say during the destruction of the Second Temple, we learned not long ago that Rabbi Yochanan Mezaka escaped Jerusalem and he met with Vespasius, the Roman general. And he asked them for a few things. One of the things they asked them is, Tenli Yavne Vechachamea, give me the city of Yavne. Yavne said, let us move the scholars and the yeshivas and the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, to the city of Yavne. Do with Jerusalem whatever you want, but let us live. Let us continue to learn Torah and to teach Torah. And he agreed. That they moved to Yavne, slowly but surely. First, Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Bezakai went to Yavne with his disciple Rabbi Yeshua. Nobody else went. And little by little, they went more and more and more. For some reason, according to the Shnitz, there is argument within scholars. They moved to another place. It's called Usha. Usha, I think, is in the north. And then they moved back to Yavne. Basically, when they moved back to Yavne as a whole group together, and they established a yeshiva, it was an inauguration party. And the greatest rabbis came and gave speeches. And this is the speeches <coughs> that we're going to learn now. Let's read. The rabbis have taught us, top, top of the page. The rabbis. Oh, that's a top, top. <laughs> top, top. The rabbis taught in Varisha when one sages entered the vineyard. And our sages mm -hmm. entered the vineyard in Yavne. Yavne. Vineyard in Yavne. The yeshiva in Yavne is called the vineyard. Why a yeshiva should be called vineyard? Vineyards are a real common metaphor. It's used in Isaiah for the Jewish people, among other passages. Why? Right. It's true. But to grow. Everything. To grow. learn. To grow. Okay. To, to ripen. ripen. To ripen. To ripen. First of all, the Talmud says one of the explanations is they used to sit in rows like a vineyard. The other explanation is what, what's in, in a vineyard? There is grapes. And the grapes, and you squeeze the grape out, you get wine. In the Torah, is almost like a secret learning. You have to squeeze to get the wine out. The Torah is compared to water. The Kabbalah, the secret part of the Torah, is compared to wine. And the even more secret is compared to oil. The more you have to squeeze it out, the more it's the secret part of the Torah. Mm -hmm. There is a Talmudic statement, Nichnas Yain Yatsa Sod. Wine comes in, the secret comes out. Mm -hmm. That same, that's the idea of the vineyard. The mm -hmm. secret should come out. You have to squeeze it. When you learn, the best of your learning doesn't come out, then you lay down on the couch, and, oh, I have my brilliant ideas. You learn and you walk and you squeeze it out, then comes out the best. That's why it's called, the, Yav, the yeshiva in Yavne is called Kerem Beyavne. And there is a yeshiva today, not far from the, from the original place where it was at that time, 2,000 years ago, it's called a yeshiva, it's a big yeshiva today, it's called Kerem Beyavne. They gave themselves the same, the same name. Is it south of Tel Aviv now? Or it's right? out, it's out, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's the same, not far from where it was the real Yavne was. The, ori the original one. Okay, who you came... Did that, you did the next line. Okay. <laughs> who, who, who was there? It was the Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Nehemiah, and Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Rabbi Yossi Aglili. They all opened up their discourses with words in honor of their hosts and expanded at scriptural verses on that theme. They wanted, basically, they came to the meeting, they got the old town people of the city, and then to inspire them, the rabbis have a job to inspire the regular inhabitants of the city to support the yeshiva, basically. That was the job, to get people excited about the yeshiva. Then every one of them came up at in, uh, in, in, in a ga and gave a speech. Then here the Talmud is describing the speech that everyone gave. Rabbi Yehuda, first of the speakers in every place, opened his discourse with the words honor of oh, the... Okay. Rabbi Yehuda was the first of the speakers in every place. What does this mean? Why was Rabbi Yehuda the first of the speakers in every place? In every event... 
In every Jewish event, Rabbi Yehuda was had to be first speaking first. Why? Yehuda. It has to do with another story. Well, they also learned in the one of the classes. They remember the story that were three rabbis sitting together and talking about the Romans. And Rabbi Yehuda praised the Romans for building marketplaces, for building uh, bed houses, for building bridges. He said they are improving society. That was Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi said nothing. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, oh, these Romans, they only what they do, they do it for their own sake. They, they make the bridges, they should be able to collect tolls. They make a, a marketplace that you could be able to have a, a prostitution. They were, everything he found, something wrong in them. Because the Romans were not nice to the Jews, as we all know. Was a rab, somebody over the conversation, his name was Yehuda <coughs> Ben Geirim, Yehuda, a son of converts. He had converts in his family. He went to me, told the story. Some, somebody, non-Jewish member, member of the family overheard the conversation, went and reported it to the government. The government made a rule. They made a court, not in front of the, of the rabbis. They said the rabbi who spoke good and the Romans should become a, a lord, should, become, should be promoted. Speaker. The rabbi who, spoke, who said nothing should be exiled to the north. He was exiled to Tsipori. It was not far from Tveria, one of these places. And the rabbi who spoke against the government should be killed. That, that's why Rabbi Shimon Ber had to run away and hide in the cave for 12 years and then another, the whole story. That's why Rabbi Yuda became the first speaker everywhere. Because he was, on the, so to speak, on the side of the Romans. At least he didn't believe in an active war against the Romans. It was an argument, a fight between the rabbis at that time. Should we take an active role to fight the Romans or should we let go? He was a politician. And, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> And, and Rabbi Yuda was said, let's survive, let's not fight the Romans. Okay. And eventually Rabbi Akiva led the big revolution of Bar Kokhba. That was the whole, that was what was going on. That Rabbi, that the, the Roman government controlled everything. They knew every meeting. They said, he better speak first, if not you're in trouble. That's why Rabbi Yuda was the first speaker everywhere. Rosh HaMedabri Bechol Makom. Okay. What he said, he expounded on a verse. He Young not, is courts with words, honor of those who study Torah and expounded verses on that theme. He said the following. The verse states, and Moses took the tent and pitched it outside of the camp. Okay, what was the story? The story is after the golden calf. It was a golden calf, right? And after that, God told Moses, you know what, from now on, I'm not going to be the one who will lead the Jewish people in the desert. I will send an angel. Not me. An angel will come. And, and when Moses saw that God doesn't want to be a part of the Jewish people, he like right. removed himself from the Jewish people, that Moses said, I'm doing the same. Moses took his, his tent and pitched it outside of the camp. He said, anybody wants to learn to, I should go outside. He, did, he, he learned from God. God doesn't want I want to. I, I'm with God. I'm not with these guys. That's the verse that he's quoting. And Moshe took the tent and pitched it outside the camp. Go ahead. And he called it the tent of meeting. He called it the tent of meeting. There's a place to meeting with God. Oil Moed, right? Go ahead. And it was that all seekers of Hashem would go out to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. And the, and the Bible continues. And all the seekers of Hashem will go out to the, t to, the t to the tent of the meeting, it's called. Is that a different tent? That and this was in contrast to the tabernacle where the priests were at the center and only they could commune with Hashem. That was, this is a that was before the tabernacle. That was right, right after the, the, the golden calf, right. before they actually built the tabernacle. At this right. point, he had only the two tablets, in a ark, in a oh, box, okay. if you want. And Moses made a decision to move himself out of the camp. And he said, anybody wants God, any seeker of Hashem should go to the, will go to the tent of the meeting to look for God. You're right, you're right. right. 
Right. It's all discussion when it was in it was it was a separate thing from right. this. But in, in general, it was right in the beginning. It was right there. Before, took them six months until the, Moses came down from Mount Sinai in the end of the older stories on Yom Kippur, right. and and they, they they inaugurated the temple, the sanctuary, on the first of Nisan. Means to say, almost six months before Pesach. This six months, he pitched the tent of the meeting outside. As we'll see soon, that was not for a long time. Then anybody who went to ask for God to speak to Moses, to learn Torah, was called the seeker of Hashem. The people who seek God. Okay. Rabbi Yehuda drew an inference uh, from these words. He said, now is the matter not a basis for a kalva homer. A kalva homer. What's a kalva homer? From lesser to greater. Yeah. For example, a kalva homer, the best example would be like this. You come and you try, you try to pick up something very heavy. That somebody tells you, if this strong guy tried to pick this up and couldn't, you think you could? That's a kalva homer. If, the, if this is so serious, if, if the, you learn from one, from the greater, from the lesser to the greater, exactly. That's, that's, that's in the, there is in one of the ways learning in the Torah is a kalva homer. The, the, that Rabbi Yudah says, Varim That's a kalva homer. What's a kalva homer? Go ahead. Well, for if to describe those who traveled to study Torah at the Ark of Hashem, which was at most only 12 mil distant from their homes. The Torah says, and it was, that all seekers of Hashem would go out to the tent of meeting. Okay. The people who went to the tent of the meeting are called, of the meeting are called seekers of Hashem. How far the seekers of Hashem went? 12 mils. How much is a mil? Three ta it was 2,000 amot. Amma is this, right? Oh, yeah. Right? 2,000 amot is 3,000 feet. 12 mils will be how much? 36,000. 36,000. How many miles is it? 36,000 uh, uh, feet. How many miles is it? 5,000. Mile, 6,000 six, miles. Mm -hmm. Right? 6,000, 6,500 miles. 6,500 miles, I mean. Right? And he says, if the people who went to see the tent of the meeting, they walked only six miles. The fathers, the fathers guy in the camp of Israel had to walk for six miles. He's called a seeker of Hashem, looking for God, seeking for, for the message of God. <coughs> then, continue, the Torah scholars. Then Torah scholars, who travel great distances from city to city and from province to province to study Torah, can all the more so be described as seekers of Hashem. Oh, he wanted, to, he wanted to teach the people of the town to appreciate the scholars, the people who learn Torah. He says, if the people in the desert are called seekers of Hashem, just because they walked seven miles, here people are coming from other cities, from all over Israel, many miles, for sure they are called seekers of Hashem. What he want, what was the conclusion? Those... Thus did Rabbi Yehuda praise Torah scholars before the people of Yavna. He wanted to, he wanted to, to elevate the people. They should appreciate the people, they appreciate the Torah, and the people learn Torah. If they appreciate the people learn Torah, they will not look on moving the yeshiva to Yavna as a burden, but they look of it as an honor, as an opportunity. Europe, in, in Jewish Europe, the Judaism, how, how they were yeshivas, how yeshivas survived. There was no big buildings for, they didn't have uh, dormitories and uh, dormitories they may be have, but for sure they didn't have uh, lunch rooms where they can feed 300 boys or 200. That the style was, it's called teg. Every yeshiva student, every day used to eat in a different family. Sunday used to eat by the wise family, Monday used to eat by the Kinberg family, Tuesday used to eat by this family. And the families of the city respected the that the, the yeshiva student to learn Torah, that many of them were having more than one student, or every day a student, not once a week. <coughs> but basically, the yeshiva, the community supported the yeshiva because they respected their learning Torah, and eventually the yeshiva student came home. If he had a girl, there was a shida. It was That's how the whole system used to work. Later came great rabbis and said, we cannot handle that the yeshiva, the yeshiva student should go like beggars to the houses. We will build a yeshiva. 
and we will have dom dormitories and, and lunch rooms. And the yeshiva will support the town. Not the town will support the yeshiva, will give them all jobs. And the, the whole, all of, all of Poland supported the yeshiva, and the people of the town actually made a living from the yeshiva. But how you, how you can establish, how you can establish, you have to, people who never learn Torah, that you have to teach them to appreciate the greatness or, and the merit of supporting people who learn Torah. That's what Rabbi Yudah really was doing. So Rabbi Senor Obdin invented the idea. He did that. He, that's what he, he wanted to explain to the people. Says if people in in the desert for seven miles are called seekers of Hashem, <coughs> people come from a country from from Lud and from and from Tzfat and from Tiberias are not seekers of Hashem. Are even much more seekers of Hashem. They go much more, mm -hmm. many more miles. That was his 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 message. While we talk about the story, what happened in the desert with Moses, the Talmud start to speak about the story itself. What happened there? With Moses. You want to continue, Mark? I haven't mentioned the above verse. The Gemara now expounds several verses connected with it. And Hashem would speak to uh, Moses' face to face. It's written that Hashem spoke to Moses face to face. The problem with this is, in the same parsha, it's written that God asked for Moses, Moses asked for God, show me your face. And what Hashem told them? You see Nobody the can see my face, face right? Yeah. That he spoke face to face. I didn't speak face to face. Well, what's going on there? That Rabbi Yitzchok said, he says the, there is a different meaning to it. The term face to face teaches that the Holy One, Blessed He, said to Moses, Moses, let us, I and you, show one another a kindly face in studying the law. Basically, there should be a learning of Torah with love because it was after the golden calf. God was kind of angry with the Jewish people. Then he, God, according to this rabbi, God said to Moses, let us have a warm relationship. Because the best way to learn Torah from a rabbi is to look, him, look in his face because you can get the radiance. We're talking about great rabbis on the Talmud, on rabbis, holy people. That the radiance, you understand better what he learns, what he teaches you if you look him into his face. Then he said, it's so to speak, God and Moses should look each other to the face, means they should, have, should, they should be excited about each other, about learning. That's Rabbi Yitzchak's explanation. Here comes the more important explanation. Another version of the exposition. Others say, so said the Holy One, blessed he to Moses, just as I've shown you a kindly face in teaching a Torah, so too you show Israel a kindly face and return the tent to its proper place, i.e. the center of the camp. God told Ooh. Moses, I, I am nice to you. You be nice to the Jewish people. Don't pitch the tent outside of the, outside of the camp. What is this? Go back to your people. Because the whole strength of Moses is that he's representing the Jewish people. If not for the Jewish people, who needs Moses? Moses is a nice guy, don't get me wrong. But is, why, why is Moses so important in the eyes of God? Because he represents the Jewish people. Where we see it, we see it in the story of the golden calf. The first word that Moses told, uh, that God told Moses when it was the golden calf, Lech red, go down. Moses was at Mount Sinai when the Jewish people made the golden calf. That the first words in the Bible, God told them, go down. What means go down? You are here because representing the Jewish people. If I'm not interested in the Jewish people, if they made the golden calf, you have no, you have no right to be here. It's like almost the politicians. The whole power of the president and the, and the Congress is because they are representative of the people. The moment they are not representative of the people, don't, they are nobodies. Who needs them? Same thing got to Moses. Your whole power is the Jewish people. If the Jewish people see the golden calf, you are, you are, nobody's behind you. You're not representing anybody. Then go down. The same thing God tells me, that's already after the golden calf. Go ahead. But at the time of the golden calf, it, it was Hashem that wanted to disown the Jewish people. And, You're right. and Moses fought for You're the right. people. You're right. But the field, yeah. And that's why he took the tent. That was already after. The, that was already after. Moses fought for the people and he got the forgiveness for the people. Right. And right. God, what God said, now I'm going dealing only with angels, not me. I will not have the same level of relationship. And Moses said, if God, if you don't have the same level of relationship, I also don't want to have to with them the same kind of relationship. Right. But God told them, no, no, no. I don't. You stay with them. 
Because if, if Moses is not with the people, that what, is, that what, what is his power? We'll see in a minute how, what the, how God makes, the, makes his point. Uh, you want to continue? Yeah. <clears throat> but it was it then on this day that Torah was given to Israel. Hmm? No, 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 no. The Gemara, Gemara expounds the continuation of the first yeah. one. Oh, oh, we didn't finish it. The Gemara expounds the continuation of the verse along these same lines. The verse continues, and he, Moses, would return to the camp. Rabbi Abahu said, The verse teaches that the Holy One, blessed is he, said to Moses, Now that you have left the camp, the people, but was it then... On this day, that no, 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 the you, people you, will say. You go over to the other column. Sure. Down. Right, right there, yeah. Mm. Now that you have left the camp, will say the master is angry, and the, the, the disciple is, is angry. angry. He says, if you leave the Jewish people, right. then what do you need to say? Hashem is angry with us. Moses is angry with us. We are left. What what will continue? What will be with the of Israel? What will be of Israel? The Who Jews will be lost. Reconcile right? them with God. Usually Moses was the one. It was like this. Whenever God was angry with the Jewish people, Moses was on their behalf. Whenever it was Moses angry, angry with the Jewish people, God was on their behalf. <laughs> God says, I am living, you are living, what's going to be here? Therefore, if you return the tent to its place in the camp, it is well. But if not, then your disciple, Joshua, the son of Nun, will serve in your place. Wow, God issued a, a threat to Moses. He said to Moses, if you come back to the Jewish people, fine. If not, I have a replacement. His name is Joshua. You're fired. You know what it means to be fired by God? You're gone. There's no firing. There's no retiring in the world of God. And there's no firing. Finish the sentence, yeah. You will be removed from the leadership. You'll be removed from the leadership. And this is the meaning of what it is written. And return to the camp. This verse is no mere report of Moses' custom, but it is command to Moses to return to the camp. To the tent, tent the to camp. the camp. Upon receiving this order, Moses returned to the camp. God told Moses, written there with shovel and macht, and he returned to the camp. You read that, you think. He went to the tent of the meeting, he returned to the camp. The Talmud says, no, 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 no. God told him, oh, you returned to the camp? Oh. Where we see it, that Moses actually, that other leaders lost their jobs when they didn't like, or didn't want to, they didn't think favorably about the Jewish people. Elijah. Elijah. Elijah, Elijah started to complain about the Jewish people. God told them, okay, on the way back, Elijah, on the way back, find your disciple. His name is Elisha. Appoint him to be the leader. And you are removed. You're fired. What do you think? One is fired. He died. That's it. And, and 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 the same thing with Moses himself. Moses himself, and he right. with the story with the with, with the with the eating of the rock. When Moses couldn't, so to speak, handle the Jewish people, God told him, "Okay, we we'll give it to Joshua." When was the beginning of Joshua's career? When was when it started the idea that Joshua could become the leader? The spies. Well, actually, at the calf, the golden calf, wasn't he? He found it. Well, he got the letter. Amalek? Amalek. Oh. <laughs> right when they left Egypt, Amalek attacked the Jewish people. Oh. Right? God told Moses, go make a war against the Amalekites. What Moses did, he appointed Joshua. God told him, ah, you didn't do it, right? You wanted Joshua to do it. Okay, I'll listen to you. Joshua, be the leader. God tells them right there. Tell the people to remember that and put in the ears of Joshua. That was a sign that he's going to be the continuation. He's going to be the successor. And here is another cycle. He says here, how the Talmud comes, he says, and Joshua never left the tent of the meeting. God told them, not you will be Joshua. The point is, God gives us opportunities. Or do you make a quetch? That's it's okay. I'll find somebody else. You don't want to fight. I'll survive. The world is full of people who had missed opportunities. Therefore, we have to grab every opportunity. Even Moshe Rabbein Hashem told them that. Rav added. 
Rabbah said, nevertheless, meaning although Moses did not return to the camp, the word was not spoken for naught, meaning the prophecy regarding Joshua's accession was not withdrawn, and eventually, and he eventually did succeed Moses as leader of the Jews. Yeah, at that point, Moses went back to the back camp, and he got the whole four years. But eventually, Joshua was the leader. Joshua became the leader of Moses, uh, the, 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 the successor of Moses, not only because he learned the Torah from Moses, but because he was dedicated to Moses. He never left his side. He was his shamesh. He not only learned Torah from him, he was there to see how Moses deals. It's like you have to take, you know, when you become a doctor, you have to take... Uh, Apprenticeships and stuff. Wow. Internships and... Internships. And you have to go and see how it's work. It's called Shimush. And, Mo, and Joshua was there. He saw how Moses is doing things. That's why he became the disciple. He took over. Because it's, it's, it's the Talmud said the same thing Elisha is to put the water on the end of Elijah. It means to say, he, he was right there taking care of him every day, <coughs> not just learning Torah from him. I mean, you see the same thing when Moshe says, uh, take my name, uh, or just uh, take me out of the box. No. And then just because he spoke it, it, it has to happen even then. Yeah, it has an effect. That's another uh, point, that if God said that he will be the leader, leader it will yeah. have an effect. Yes. Okay, <coughs> that's the story. That's one part of Rabbi Yeshua. Continue. The Gemara now returns to Rav Yehuda's opening remarks at the vineyard in Yavna. To continue to the speech in Yavna. And Rav Yehuda opened further with words in honor of those who study Torah and expounded the following verse. He wanted, Rav Yehuda felt that he has to uh, glorify the people who learn Torah, then everybody else wants to be their supporters, want to be help them, want to be a part of it. That was his agenda. What he said... Pay heed and listen, Israel, on this day. You have become a nation. Today you have become a nation. It's written in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses told the Jewish people, Ask it to Shema Israel. The word Shema Israel is used a few times in the Bible. Shema Israel, hear Israel. What, what you should hear? Today you became a nation. When was written the book of Deuteronomy? When Moses said it? Like, like three weeks before he five, died. Five, five weeks before he died. Today we became a nation? And what were we doing for the four years? We were Egyptian. What is today we became a nation? When the Jewish people became really a nation? At Mount Sinai. The Taoist Moses saying, after four years, listen Israel, today you became the nation of God. What is this? The uh, Talmud says, continue, but, but... But was it then on this day that Torah was given to Israel? That scripture should say that they then became a nation. A nation, they became a nation. That was the Torah was given. Continue. But was this day not at, at the end of the 40 years spent in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Accordingly, Israel's ascent into nationhood came many years earlier at Mount Sinai. How can the verse say that it happened on this day? Oh, yeah, we already na a nation for 40 years, and suddenly the, the Bible tells us, Moses tells us, Today you became a nation. Ella, rather, go ahead. Okay. Rather, verse is meant to teach you that on each day and every day the Torah is as dear to those who study it as on the day it was given for Mount Sinai. Aha. And thus did Rabbi Yehuda praise those who study Torah. A man has to feel that the Torah is given today. He has to be so excited about the Torah like it was given today. It's not a whole story. Yeah, the whole Torah 3,000 years ago. Yeah, we heard the story. He has to feel as though he was there. No he has to feel, feel yeah, that's today. one thing. Right. The other thing he has to feel that was given today. It's like if you get something, you discover something new. The excitement is in the, in the sky, right? If we would discover today the... the the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Today we will discover them. Can you imagine the news? Today a person has to wake up in the morning and be excited going to learn Torah like the, he got it today. It has to be, by, it has to be as new. The Torah has to be as new. Kachadoshim. It has to be like new. The Torah has to renew itself every day. It's not like an old Torah. Fresh. Exactly. Fresh, excited. That's how your person has to learn Torah. And that's what he says. He says, what means... 
Today you became a nation? Yeah, every day. Today is today. Every day is the day. No, there is there is the D day. Every day is D day. And that's what the Rabbi uh, uh, he says. How could you become? Could be, how could you have, have the excitement? When you learn Torah, you get excited about again and again. We saw in life that people learn Torah. That's the best fuel for them growing in spirituality. People who don't learn, they dry out. You know what I mean? People who learn, a person who is really excited about it. Think about it. We, we read the story of Joseph and his brothers every year in the, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue, right? Every year you get sad when you read the story. Every year you get, you, look, go, you, you live it through. You read it a thousand times. It's new. And that's the goal. The goal is to make the Torah exciting on our children, on ourselves. And when the Torah is exciting, everybody wants to be around it. Everybody wants to learn something exciting. Everybody wants to be around exciting people. Everyone you see in an excited place. I tell people, don't worry about your kids that are not around the table. If it will be exciting to be around you, they will be there. That's the goal. And that's what Rabbi Yuda says, that, by the, the, the people come to learn Torah for them, they are excited about the learning Torah every day, and some of it will rub off on the people of Yavne. That's what he's really telling them. Continue. The Gemara expands further. Supports Rabbi Yudha. Uh, before that, one paragraph oh. before. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. No the problem. Gemara support, supports our Yehuda's interpretation of the verse. Know that this is so. For behold, the man recites the Shema every morning and evening. Yet if one evening he does not recite it, he seems like one who has never recited the Shema. It's interesting. The Talmud says something very, you know, every morning we have the mitzvah to say the Shema. And every evening. Why? Because it's written in the Shema itself. There is a mitzvah. You have to learn the Torah when you wake up in the morning. of kumecha. When you lay down, when you wake up. It means a Jew has an obligation to learn at least a little bit of Torah every night and every morning. Then what is the learning Torah? Where is the mitzvah? How we fulfill it? The Shema itself. The Shema is apart from the Torah. When you recite the Shema, you're learning Torah in the evening. When you recite the Shema, you recite learn the Torah in the morning. If somebody misses one Shema, he's so upset, like he never said the Shema. Why? Because it's, because by him every day is a, a new Torah. It's not like, oh, I said four years the Shema, big deal, one time I will not say the Shema. He doesn't feel like this. No, it's interesting. My when my my father was in Russia. He was a, a, he tried to immigrate to Israel. In 19, he tried to escape from Russia in 1947 with a group of yeshiva students. There's a whole story, and there was a guy who was was supposed to to uh, to take him to uh, the, the borders, and then he, he himself led him into the police department. Basically, he got him into trouble. He was in jail for six and a half years. Then. And one of the hardest things it was to how to keep Pesach, not to eat chometz, not to eat bread. The only thing you got there was bread. And every year, he used to, whole year, he used to he used to exchange his bread pieces with other people for sugar, that he should have enough pieces of sugar for Pesach to survive. Huh. And and before he, a few years before he passed away, my 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 brother-in-law asked him, "What do you regret about about uh, the jail?" He tells him, "One year." I calculated the days of Pesach. He didn't have a Jewish calendar in jail. Yet we we'll understand from secret letters that he calculated the days. In, in his mind, Pesach started a day earlier and ended a day earlier. And only later he discovered it was a day later. That on the eighth day of Pesach, he ate chometz. And my father, by the, after eight days of Pesach, he was about, was at the verge of death. Because he, he, could, he didn't eat anything. He ate only sugar and water. And he was crying that they missed the eighth day of Pesach, he was eating bread. That means somebody who is, like he feels, it seems like he, like, he, like one who never recited the Shema. That he's so excited about a mitzvah like it was the first time in your life. This can only be, go ahead, finish this. This can only be because we continue to hold the words of the Torah so dear that we treat them as if they had been given that very day. Exactly. Only when it's something new, you have this dearness that a person should have to the Torah. All of this, Rabbi Yudha gave a speech 
in the, play, in the, in the inauguration of Yavne, to tell the people of Yavne how lucky they are that the center of Torah uh, learning moved to their city. Now we'll turn the page. We'll go to the left column, almost in the middle, in the, in the bottom. The Gemara now returns to the opening remarks. You see it? Yeah, I see it. Um, the remarks of the other sages in the vineyard of Yavda. Exactly. Rabbi Nechemaya opened his discourse. Nechemia. Nechemia opened his discourse with words in honor of their hosts and expounded the following verse regarding that which is written. In top of the page of the le left column, the right column, I'm yeah. sorry. And Saul said to the Kani, go turn away and go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with Amalek. Amalek, Amalek. And you have done kindness with all the children of Israel. What's going on here? Saul had a war against the Amalekites. God told Saul to go and to destroy the Amalekites. The Canaanites were neighbors of the Amalekites. Who were the Canaanites? The Canaanites. The Canaanites. Who were the Canaanites? Descendants of whom? Yithro. Of Jethro. The Canaanites were the gentle in the. That was how many years after after Yithro? 300 years after Yithro? So, something mm -hmm. like this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 300 yeah, years they, later. They flourished, they flourished. The Canaanites were, they were nice to the Jews. Yeah, Jethro was nice to the Jews. Right. Then, okay. then Saul, I, huh? I, I thought that Jethro was the, the priest of the Midianites. Midianites, but they called the Canaanites too. Okay, same. Yeah. And why are they called the Canaanites? Yeah, I don't know names. what. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's true, good point. The Jethro had many names. Canaan, the Canaan the, uh, the are the Jethro's. <laughs> The descendants of Jethos. Right. That Saul, before he's going to attack the Amalekites, he tells the Canaanites, because your great grandfather was nice to the Jews, he didn't tell great grandfather, he says, e and you have done kindness with all the children of with all the children of Israel. What was there? What were all the children of Israel? Jethro was nice to Moses. Three hundred years before. Saul kept be kept the remember that and wanted to be nice to them because of this. Let's read what the Talmud says. It's meaning as it as it as follows. follows. Yesterday, forefather the Canaanite, Canaanites had many years earlier host Moses, Aaron, and all the elders of Israel at a feast. Right? You remember the story when Jethro came to the desert. Moses left his wife and his children in Midian, right. and he went to yeah. Egypt to redeem the Jewish people. Try and everything was nice and fine and he took the Jewish people out and he made many miracles and time passed and Jethro is stuck with his daughter and his grandchildren <laughs> and he said what is this, this is not, there is no end to this business he, he, he initiated something, he took him on a journey he went to the desert and he sent a message to, Mo a message to Moses, he says your father no Jethro is coming with, his, with your wife Tipora and with your two children Moses came out to greet to greet them. Moses went, Aaron went, Aaron went. The whole, all the, the whole nation came out to greet greet Jethro. And then it's written, Jethro came, and he had a meal with Moses and Aaron and the, and the, and the seventy elders and the elders of Israel. That Moses, that Aaron, that Jethro fed at a feast with the with the leaders of Israel. That's what he's talking about. Let's now uh, let's see what he says now. Esau, the forefather of the Canaanites, had many years earlier hosted Moses, Aaron, and the old elders of Israel at a feast. That's the feast we are talking about. Go ahead. King Saul. King Saul viewed his act as a kindness performed with all of Israel. King Saul looked on this kindness that he fed one time, he had a feast with, the, with Moses and Aaron and the elders of Israel as a kindness to all Israel. He says, he says you, you were kind to all Israel. What means all Israel? To the elders of Israel. And accordingly rescued his descendants from destruction. Rabbi Nechemiah accordingly inferred. Now is this a matter not a basis for all For a Kalva Homer? For if, with regard to Yisro who drew Moses close only for the sake of his own honor. It is thus 
yet he is considered to have performed the kindness with all of Israel. The one who, for no ulterior motive, hosts a Torah scholar in his home and feeds him and gives him to drink and benefits him from his possessions is all the more so considered to have done kindness with all of Israel. Okay. Rabbi Nehemiah took a different approach. He didn't come to speak how great the Torah scholars are. He wanted to say how great the reward for people who support Torah scholars. He spoke to the people. He didn't say, oh, you know, they are so great, it's good for you. He says, your act is great. He says like this, if, if, if Jethro, who made one meal for, the Jew, for, for Moses and Aaron and the, and the oldest of Israel, 300 years later, Saul is remembering them the kindness and therefore is saving the whole people of the Canaanites from a war. And, and, and Jethro did it for one meal, he did it for his own honor, so to speak. That anybody who brings in a scholar and he takes care of him and he feeds him, not for one meal, and protects them and supports them and, do, and doesn't do it for his own honor. He do it just because how much more he will get reward from that. That's what he wanted to make a point. Then by somebody supporting the Torah scholars, how much more he will be rewarded, more than Jethro. If Jethro 300 years later got so much reward, how much every one of us who will support a scholar will get more than that. That was Rabbi Nehemiah's approach. Those did Rabbi Nehemiah give. Thus did Rabbi Nehemiah give honor to those who opened their homes to the Torah scholars of Yavna. He spoke, he spoke, you see, Rabbi Yuda came and told them, oh, the Torah is great. Rabbi Nehemiah was more practical. So forget about how great the Torah is, how great you are. When you are opening the homes for these people, your reward will be unbelievable. That was Rabbi Nehemiah's approach. Now we learn what Rabbi Yossi said. The Gemara quotes Rabbi Yossi's opening remarks. Rabbi Yossi opened his discourse with the words in honor of their hosts and expounded the following verse. Do not reject an Edomite, for he is your brother. Do not reject an Egyptian, for you were a sojourner in his land. Right? It's a very interesting line in the Bible. In the Bible. Do not hate an Egyptian, because you were a foreigner in his land. You know, there is a big discussion about buying German goods, not buying German goods, right? What the Torah says here? The Torah says here, how much we suffer to the Egyptian? Greatly, right? Mm -hmm. Still the Torah says, they welcomed you. When you, but it was a famine, they welcomed you, right? When Jacob and, and his children had nothing to eat, who welcomed them? The Egyptian. Jews were in Egypt for 210 years. Out of this, 60 years, 80 years they suffered. Then, 130 years were good years, right? The Torah says, do not despise an Egyptian because you were, let the tie of Mitzri, do not despise an Egyptian because you were a, a, a foreigner in his land. And this also, when you think about, you know, uh, boycotting uh, Germany in this, the rabbis didn't like it when, right after the World War II because they said from the Bible, we learn, how many years Jews were in, in Germany? A thousand years. So, the end was a very bad end. Yeah, I agree. But a thousand years. <coughs> cannot do away with a thousand years. They learned it from here. Here, Rabbi, Rabbi Yossi says like this. If it's written in the Bible, do not eat an Egyptian because you were a foreigner in, in his land. So, continue. Now. Now is this matter not a basis for a call of Homer? For if with regard to the Egyptians, who drew Israel close only for their own purposes, as it is stated concerning Pharaoh's request regarding Joseph's brothers, and if you know that there are among them the men of special strength, then appoint them officers over the flocks that are mine. Okay, when Joseph, when the brothers, when Jacob and his sons arrived to Egypt, Pharaoh welcomed them and gave them the city of Goshen, but then he told them, you know, if among your brothers are some good guys, Draft them to me. I want to use them. Then from this, the, time, the Rabbi Yossi says, means to say that the whole agenda of Pharaoh was, it was good for him. He was looking what's good for him. He didn't do it for, to save the, the Jewish people. He did it for his own sake. <coughs> then said, if Pharaoh will welcome the Jews for his own sake, the Torah tells us forever and ever, do not hate and despise an Egyptian. How much more? It is those 
It is thus, i.e., that the Torah nevertheless requires us to show them gratitude. To the Egyptian, go ahead. Then one who for no ulterior motive hosts a Torah scholar in his home and feeds him and gives him to drink and benefits him from his possessions would all the more so be deserving of great gratitude. It means to say like this, if a, if a Jew who, doesn't, who is welcoming a, a Torah scholar is in his home, not for his own sake, he's not benefiting from it, he's not doing it for his own sake, he just wanted to support this Torah scholar, should have what to eat, where to sleep, while he's learning Torah. How much more? If an Egyptian, forever you're not allowed to hate him, forever, because 3,300 years ago, they took care of us, it's almost, it's, I mean, we're talking about taking 210 years, 3,500 3, years ago. We are not allowed to despise an Egyptian today because 3,500 years ago he was welcoming us. Somebody was welcoming another Jew, a rabbi in his own, for sure he will, that was, uh, will, will reward him for it. But we have a different relationship, obviously, with Amalek and the Canaanites. They, they were never good to us. <laughs> the Amalekites, the Amalekites, why we don't, we don't say it about the Amalekites? Yeah, say, they, were, they had no period of being good to us, either one so of them. Not only the problem they will not have a period good for us, the Amalekites, we had no relationship with them. They came out of nowhere to attack the Jews. The Jews didn't go their way. The Jews didn't mind their, mind their own. The Jews mind their own business. And they came and they started to attack the Jews. Right. Why? Who is a Malik? A Malik? Who, who is a Malik no, coming from? He saw he saw what he saw Gansa. Right. That he saw a hater to Jacob was in a Malik. A Malikite represent a nation or a person or a people. Who just ate Jews for no reason. Just for, he never met a Jew, he's hating him already. You ever saw him one? Ever dealt with him? Somebody hurt you? No, he hates him. That's a Malik. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian, they helped the Jews. They true that sometimes they were angry, sometimes they were good, but there is a relationship there. The Amalekites are hating the Jews for no reason. Want to destroy the Jewish people. That's why we compare the Nazis to the Amalekites, because that means they the Nazis didn't want just to get rid of the Jews in Germany. They wanted the Jews should not exist. There is a story about a rabbi, he said, uh, the mayor of New York, Ed, uh, what is his name, Mayor Kach, he once went to Germany. And he said he, they took him for a tour and they took him to Hitler's office. And it was a globe on the, on the floor, a big globe. That's what's the globe. He says it was written numbers, like a big pen. In every country, how many Jews are there? And in one country, it was written one. One Jew. If it's one Jew, we have to destroy him. That's a Malachite. And therefore, Mayor, Kirch, Mayor Ed Katch has to say, he's a Holocaust survivor. I don't know why can you be a Holocaust survivor? He says, if, not, if he wouldn't destroy, stop the Nazis, he would go everywhere. But every Jew is a Holocaust survivor. And that's a Malachite. But the Egyptians were different. The opening remarks of Rabbi Lezer, go ahead. The next one, the last, <coughs> that's the last one, yeah. The opening remarks of Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Rabbi Yosef Gili. Gili. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Ra uh, Rabbi uh, Yossi Gili. Don't turn the page, it's in the bottom. discourse and bottom. with a words in honor of their host and expounded the following verse. Mm -hmm. And Hashem blessed Ovid Edom because of the ark of the Lord which he kept in his home. Oh, what happened then? King David, you remember there is a story in the Bible that the, the, the sons of Eli went to war, they took with them the Ark of the Covenant, they wanted to win the war with the Philistines. Not only did they not win the war, they were killed, and the Philistines took the, the Ark of the Covenant. And then many years later, King David came, and he, brought, he started to bring it back, and he put the Ark of the Covenant on what? On a wagon. And the Ark of the Covenant has to be carried on shoulders. And the Ark was almost started to fall. They were started to walk with it. And Uzzah ran to all down to support it. Mm -hmm. And Uzzah died because he touched the Ark. Because God was upset that the Ark of the Covenant should not be pulled by animals. should be carried on the shoulders. That's what is written in the Bible. That David was so upset from this tragedy that this man died. He didn't want to bring it to Jerusalem. He moved it to. He took it to the to the to Oved the Oved the Edomite. He had like a like a vein like a property like a estate, and he left it there. He didn't want to touch it. Then what happened? God 
blessed over the over the Edomite because he was hosting the Ark of the Covenant. He did very well. All his all the children, all the pregnant women, they had boys, and it was it was unbelievable what was going on there. For three months, I think it was there. And King David saw that it was for him, that that he's doing so well. He came he came, he came to take to take the ark. He understood that that we have to take it. Then he, that, that's the story. Then Rabbi 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 Yossi Aglili, the Galilite, he says he, he learned from it something. Go ahead. Now is this matter not a basis for a kala vomer? Kala vomer. For if in the case of the one who kept the ark, which did not eat or drink but before which he merely cleaned and laid the dust. It was thus, i.e., that Hashem blessed him. And then one who hosts a Torah scholar... He says like this, if the Ark of the Covenant, who doesn't demand food, right? You don't have to feed the Ark. And you don't have to take care of him. You don't have to drink him. You have to clean around him the dust. Just respect it. God bless the person who was holding the Ark so well, with so much blessings. How much more... Go ahead. That uh, the one who hosts a Torah scholar in his home, he blessed him. And, and he... And his possessions will all the more so be assured of receiving great... Uh, if somebody him. takes a Torah scholar in his home, so what's a Torah scholar? Somebody who learns the Torah. This is the Ark of the Covenant. What is in the Ark of the Covenant? The, ten ta the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, the Torah. Right. That somebody who learns Torah, and here it's much harder to support, to, to take care of a Torah scholar. He hits and he drinks and he drives you crazy and he needs this and he needs this and he wants this and he's going, he's coming. How much more God will reward him? That this is, that was the inauguration of the yeshiva in Yavne. Every rabbi wanted to inspire the people of Yavne, the town people of Yavne, how rewarding it's going to be that they will have the, the, they have the yeshiva among them. Rabbi Yudha spoke more about how great the Torah is. They spoke how, how rewarding it will be for them if they will take care of it. And everyone took another story from the Bible to show them how, how important. Some people took the bad guys if God took care of the, of the Egyptian, if God took care of Jethro. And it goes really generation after generation. And finally it comes to the Ark of the Covenant. Instead of God took care of the Ark of the Covenant, gave broad blessing to everybody around, how much more are you going to get a blessing? And therefore, it's now what's the lesson to us? Everybody has to make from his home a home of Torah. To have Jewish books, to be to be it should be a home that when you when you sit by the dinner table, you can say a word of Torah, you can learn a little bit. You can you, even you learn your children see your grandchildren see. Connection, and this robs off on the kids and the grandchildren. And if God took care of all the people who took care of of the words of Torah, He will take care of us. I just had an idea.